you are so powerful, God. Not only, not only are you powerful, but God, you, you love us. And you come through for us all the days of our lives and you will always come through us, come through for us. And I am holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Oh, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my
Good morning, Grove Church family. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you've been a part of praising the Lord with us together today in person, online, or via our television ministry. I look forward to being back in the pulpit with you October 8th. But until then, today you're in for a real treat as Steve Bradshaw is gonna be sharing God's word with us. He serves with the Southern Baptist of Virginia and he's been a pastor for a number of years, has served with churches all across our state. And today he's gonna to be sharing with us about what it means to love one another as God's family. You know, God has blessed us with being a part of a church as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, sometimes like in any family, well, sometimes there's kind of ups and downs in a family. Sometimes there's kind of good and bad days in a family, but you know what? We're his family, we're God's family. And praise the Lord, we have a perfect heavenly father. Praise the Lord, we have the Lord Jesus who has redeemed us and made it possible for us to be a part of God's family. And when we're filled with the spirit, well, it's amazing what God can do in and through his family. So I hope that you'll welcome Brother Steve Bradshaw now to our pulpit. Thank you for being here today. Let's now open God's word together as we learn what it means to be the church right here, right now. Amen. Well, good morning, Grove family. It's good to be with you this morning. What uh, awesome worship this morning, right? What a, what a praise to the Lord and offering to him. What a great worship team you have, right? And now it's prepared us for the word of God. It is a privilege and honor to be among you this morning to share God's word. I am so grateful for your treasured history and your current ministry to your community and beyond, your partnership with other churches and the spreading of the gospel. And I am confident that the Lord has great things in store for the days ahead, right? I love that we sang about the faithfulness of God this morning. I don't know who needed to hear that, but I needed to hear that, his, that he's faithful, right? He is faithful. The very one who began a good work in you is the very one who's going to be faithful to complete it. Amen? So the Lord has laid on my heart this morning to share with you a very simple command that Jesus gives to the church in John's gospel. It's a simple command, and yet at the same time, it's not always easy to execute. So look with me at this command in John's, John's gospel, chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, if this is a new commandment, that must have meant that there was an old commandment, right? So the old commands were given in the Old Testament book of the law and by the prophets. It was and is impossible to keep all of the rules and the commands that we find there. We fall short of them all of the time. We sin against God, we sin against each other. But Jesus, but Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again to pay the penalty of our sins and shortcomings to save us from an eternal hell to all eternity in heaven and to give us abundant life here on earth. So because we have this salvation in none other than Jesus himself, he gives us this new commandment. As a matter of fact, he said that all of the other commands can be hung on two commandments and that is to love God and to love others. This is the new commandment that he's talking about. Love the body of Christ, love each other the way that Jesus loves us. So how does Jesus love us? Well, he loved us so much that he humbled himself and he became a man to live a sinless life, to die the cruelest of deaths on the cross, to atone for our sins. And he rose victoriously on the third day from a borrowed tomb to give us victory, to give us life abundantly and to give it to us eternally. How else did Jesus love? Well, he discipled close followers. He ate with sinners. He had close friends. He performed miracles. He preached and taught to the crowds. He washed feet. He had compassion and he loved his creation. That's how we are to love one another, the way that Christ loves us, amen? So if you're near somebody this morning, why don't you look to your neighbor and say, I might not know you that well, but I love you. 
<laughs> it's kind of funny because some of you are saying that to your spouse, right? <laughs> I might not know you that well, but I love you. Those are good words, right? But they are words. And sometimes it's mere lip service, right? It's out of humility and compassion and sacrifice, esteeming others higher and putting others ahead of ourselves. That's how Jesus loves you and loves me. It's more than words. And therefore, we are to love one another. So let me give you a roadmap of where we're headed this morning in the message. First, I want to give you an overview of the one another's in Scripture. It'll be a brief overview. And then secondly, I want us to consider the one another's that are not found in Scripture. And then finally, we're going to look at loving one another as Christ loves us. And so we're going to examine other secondary one another's that we find in Scripture. So first, let me give you an overview of the one another's that are in Scripture. Did you know that one another is two words in the English language, but it's only one word in the Greek language? One another is used some 100 times in 94 New Testament verses. 47 of those verses give instructions to the church. 60% of those instructions come from the Apostle Paul. There are some common themes of, one, of the one another's, like unity. One third of the one another commands deal with the unity of the church. Then one third of them also deals with the theme of love, how Christians are to love one another. Humility, about 15% stress an attitude of humility and deference among believers. And then there's an array of singular focuses on the one another's. You can find a list of one another's in scripture and multi, and multitude of discipleship studies. One of my favorites is actually Nancy Lee DeMoss. Many of you ladies know her writings. You can Google it, check it out at your leisure. But that's kind of an overview of the one another's in scripture. So second thing I want us to look at this morning are the one another's that are not in scripture. The one and others that are not in scripture. You might be surprised by this, but you will not find these in God's word. He would never command us or encourage us to do the following. Sanctify one another. Humble one another. Scrutinize one another. Pressure one another. Embarrass one another. Corner one another. Interrupt one another. Defeat one another. Sacrifice one another. He would never tell us to shame one another or to marginalize one another or to exclude one another or to judge one another or to run one another's life or to confess one another's sins. You see, our personal walk with the Lord is reflected in the way that we treat one another. And if we are true followers of Jesus, we will treat others like we would treat him, like the king that he is and he deserves. But the opposite is also true. Because if we're not following Christ, we're likely living very selfish lives, pursuing our own agendas, putting ourselves ahead of others, and we'll, we will treat others like second-class second citizens. So our love for one another reveals what we really believe about Jesus, opposed to what we think we believe about Jesus. It reveals our true convictions as opposed to our opinions. You see, when the gospel grips us deep in our convictions, we believe it, we accept it, and we live it out wholeheartedly. But when we mistreat one another, it reveals a deeper problem. It's not the lack of surface niceties. We can be nice on the outside, but it reveals a lack of gospel depth or spiritual depth on the inside, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I think the world today needs better manners, don't you? I, I think we need to be nicer than we are, don't you? 
But what we really need is a deep faith and trust in Jesus so that we can love each other the way that Jesus loves us. That's what we really need. And it's then that John says in verse 35 that a watching world will know whose we are, that we belong to Jesus, that we are his disciples. I read an article earlier this year that I saved from desiring God. I love how the author, Scott Hubbard, he offered categories for the one another's in scripture. I call these the secondary one another's. Remember I said earlier that there are some 100 times in the New Testament that Jesus and the apostles tell us to feel or to say or to do something to one another. So we're to care for one another, for instance. We're to bear with one another. We're to honor one another. We're to sing to one another. We're to do good to one another. We're to forgive one another. And then there's this overarching, this most repeated one another, the command that binds everything together. And that is to love one another. So let me give you these one another's in Hubbard's six categories, and I'll call them the secondary one another's. If we're gonna love one another, which is primary, the way that Christ loves us, then we need to first of all, have the mind of Christ. We need to esteem others higher than ourselves. Let me give you these references. Paul says to the church at Philippi in chapter two, verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count one another more significant than yourself. First Peter five, five says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. You see, we might be tempted to approach the one another's with a list of what we should be doing for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And certainly as we look at these one another's in its totality, there are commands that should lead us to obedience and should lead us to action. But before we say or do anything for one another, God calls us into this covenant relationship with each other. So we should think and feel something toward one another because of whose we are. Have this mind among yourselves, Paul says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And this mind or attitude can be captured in a key word that we find in both of these verses. And that key word is humility. You see, I think it's possible to obey the one another's on the surface, on the outside, and yet our mind and our heart not be in sync with Jesus on the inside. Let me give you some examples. You can greet one another with a nice smile, but behind that smile, there could be bitterness. You could encourage someone, you could flatter them, and deep down, you're really jealous of them. You can bear one another's burdens, but below the surface, you wanna come across as the problem solver. You wanna be the savior, you wanna get the credit. And before you know it, the focus of the one another is not on the other, but it's on you. Does that make sense? But humility is the mind, the heart, the attitude, the posture, and the action of Christ. Humility helps us see others the way that Jesus does. Jesus humbled himself when he came to earth in the form of man. Jesus humbled himself when he came to serve rather than to be served. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on the cross. There's probably no greater visual of humility than the picture of Jesus taking the cloth and taking the bowl of water and washing the feet of his disciples. His humility went low, it went below the surface, it went below the table to the dirty feet of these men to raise them up, to lift them up, to undeserved position and a seat at the table, esteeming them higher than he did himself. That's the mind, that's the heart, that's the attitude, that's the posture, that's the action of Jesus, and it should be ours, amen? So when is the last time You humbled yourself and washed someone's feet. When is the last time that you esteemed someone higher than yourself? And then you have to ask yourself, do I then really have the mind of Christ? 
Am I esteeming others higher than myself? Well, that leads us to the second category of the one another's. If we're going to love one another the way that Christ loves us, then we will welcome and show hospitality to one another. And there's three verses I want to share with you concerning this. Paul says to the church at Rome in chapter 12, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. He says in chapter 15, verse 7, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Notice that the first category of the one another's that Hubbard has given us in this article started inwardly with the mind of Christ, which is humility, and now he moves outwardly to the eyes, the mouth, and the outreached hand. We see this in the example of Jesus. The mind of Christ led to action. In his humility, he came down to earth toward us, not away from us, but he came down to us. He came to us with a welcome. He welcomed us. He opened the door. He is the door, right? He opened his arms. His spirit drew us to himself. His love and compassion for all of mankind that he created gives us this sweet fellowship with him and with each other. This is the kind of love that turns strangers, acquaintances, into brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the kind of love that turns strangers into disciples, followers of Jesus. And now we, as his disciples, walk in that same love and offer that same fellowship and welcome to others. Paul says, welcome one another. Welcome one another. Now that sounds easy in theory, but here again, a welcome is more than a gesture. It's more than just nodding, good morning, right? It's more than a verbal greeting of hello. And Paul is very specific when he says that the welcome is not meant for only the people whom we like, but rather the command calls us to embrace and to associate with and to invite into our homes everyone in our church, including those who seem to be lowly and those whom we are tempted to judge or dislike. You see, if Christ left heaven to welcome sinners like you and me, and he did, then we can cross the church aisle or meet in the foyer to welcome members who are not like us or who doesn't always agree with us. And if Jesus opened his heart to let strangers in, and he did, then we ought to be able to open our heart and our homes to others, even to strangers. Strangers. Strangers are people whom we don't know very well. They're unfamiliar to us. They're outsiders. They're visitors. Or it could just be people who are a bit strange. I mean, do you know everyone that's in this room this morning, worshiping? If not, then they are strangers to you, right? Or maybe you know them, but they are just a bit strange. <laughs> now, it might not be the case at Grove, but there are some strange people in church, right? So now you might want to look to your neighbor and say, are you the strange one or is it me? But either definition, Paul says that we are to welcome strangers into our homes. Jesus welcomed sinners, and he welcomed strangers, and he welcomed the lonely, and we're to do likewise. Not just welcome church members we like, not just welcome church members that we have things in common with, who share the same family dynamic, who belong to the same Sunday school or small group, who attend the same school, or who are affiliated with the same political party, or who like the same sports teams. While there's a natural bend to gravitate to these folks, there's also a natural bend to become cliquish. And Paul says that we are to show hospitality to everyone. And everyone means Everyone, 
Now, how do we do that practically? Matthew Imadi, who is one of the contributors to the nine marks booklets, we have these in our church, he says, here's how you do that. You arrive early to church just so that you can chat with people and introduce yourself to people. You don't have to be a greeter, an official greeter, to greet and welcome guests. So he says to step up and step out of your comfort zone and start welcoming people. He says, serve in the nursery. (laughs) Serve in children's ministry. You want to meet new people? Serve in the children's area. Sing loudly and sing cheerfully. I don't know why he didn't say sing on key, But he said, sing loudly and cheerfully to encourage and admonish one another in corporate worship. He also said, sit by different people each week to get to know different folks. I mean, we don't have our own pews or assigned seats in this room, do we? So let's take advantage. How many of you are sitting in the same seat you did last week? Okay. So next week, this side. Next week, this side, right? And he says, don't rush out the door as soon as the service is over. Hang around, talk to people. Invite people to join you for lunch at a restaurant or in your home. Intentionally open your home. Invite people to spend time with you and you with them. It could be just for coffee. It could be for dessert. It could be for a meal. Encourage them, pray for them, serve them, share joys and burdens with them. Now, I've got to tell you, this welcome and hospitality thing can be costly. It can cost you financially, and it will cost you in your scheduling of your time and expend emotional and physical energy, but it's worth it. Why? Because hospitality is about serving others like Jesus. Serving requires sacrifice and self-giving. Can we do that, church, family? Can we offer welcome and hospitality to everyone? Okay, who's taking me to lunch? (laughs) The third category of the one another's is speak the word of God to one another. If we're gonna love one another the way that Christ loves us, then we will speak the word of God. Here are references. Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, chapter three, verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. First Thessalonians 5, 11, Paul says, encourage one another, build one another up. Hebrews 3, 13, exhort one another every day. Anybody remember this saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Anybody remember that? That's not true. People can be very hurtful with their words, can't they? So we must make sure that as followers of Jesus, we intentionally speak words of encouragement that build one another up. We've also heard people say actions speak louder than words, right? And that might be true, but the reality is this, words matter. Not to mention our attitude when we speak those words, our tone, the volume of our voice, the sighing, the gestures that we make, the rolling of our eyes, the folding of our arms, it's all part of our communication, verbal and nonverbal. But as believers in Jesus, we all possess this living, abiding word of God. And it is our role to bring the living word of God to others through our conversations. Paul says that we are not to only speak, but we're to teach, we're to instruct, we're to admonish, we're to encourage, we're to exhort, we're to comfort, we're to honor, we're to stir up, and yes, we're to even sing the living word of God. So let your voice be heard with the attitude, the tone, the words of Jesus that build up the body of Christ. That's certainly how we can love one another with our words. And by the way, for those of us who find it sometimes difficult, it's awkward sometimes, we get stuck, we don't know what to say in certain circumstances. When you don't know what to say, speak God's word 
It speaks for itself and it addresses every need. So as we welcome one another, as we show hospitality to one another, don't be afraid to look for opportunities to talk to people and share a portion of God's word that applies to the occasion or the circumstance in their life, that it may give grace to those who hear. So we're to be ready to stir up one another to love and good works from God's word. Now, I'm not saying that we need to necessarily cut all of the small talk. I'm not saying that at all. But if we're going to genuinely love one another, there should be some intentionality in moving from general conversation on the surface to spiritual conversation that encourages and edifies one another. Amen? Hubbard reminds his readers that if we're going to be talking people, that also means we need to be listening people. Communication goes both ways. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, we can speak the word of God faithfully and accurately only when we listen with the ears of God. That's how we get to know our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we get to know their heart. That's how we get to hear their testimony. We learn of their needs and their desires, and we do so by listening. But we also listen because the Lord places people in our lives who speak the truth and who encourage us as well. So we need to have open ears to listen, and we need to have open mouths to speak God's word to one another. Now, based on my calculation, we should be at the fourth category. Is that where you are? The fourth category of the one another's is show the love of Christ to one another. If we're gonna love one another the way that Christ does, we've got to show the love of Christ to them. Here are references. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, his first letter, always seek to do good to one another. 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Paul says to the church at Galatia, at Galatia chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So as important as our words are to others, people need more than words, Right? They need action. They need us to do the word, to live out the word. Jesus didn't just speak. He didn't just preach. He didn't just teach. He healed their diseases. He touched them. He delivered them from demonic possession and bondage of sin, and he ate with them. And so as his disciples, we've got to be more than talking heads to one another. We also have to be his hands and his feet and his shoulders. We not only speak his love, but we speak and we show it and we live it. Now I've got to tell you, when we serve others, it seems that it requires more sacrifice than just offering a few words of encouragement or edification. And that's because it does require more sacrifice. I mean, after all, it's one thing to speak comforting words or to post a message on Facebook, or to post a prayer emoji on social media, or send a card or text someone, but it's a whole different level of service to sit long hours in the hospital to comfort a family whose loved one is having surgery, or sitting in the home with a family who has just lost a loved one, or carrying a meal over to a home after someone in their family has passed away or to stop by and cut grass and weed eat because someone is recovering from surgery. That's a whole different level, isn't it? And it requires sacrifice. My wife and I were recently playing pickleball. Anybody play pickleball? Yeah. And she took a tumble as she was striving to reach this short ball right outside of the kitchen. Isn't that the craziest terminology you've ever heard for a sport? But right outside of the kitchen, she said, I, I, I've been waiting for somebody to tell me to stay out of the kitchen. But she reached for a ball and she tumbled and she ruptured her Achilles tendon, which requires surgery and almost a year of recovery, just to be honest with you. The very next day, I was headed to Duke to have a tumor removed off of my neck. So here I am in North Carolina. She's in Midlothian at the orthopedic doctor. And by nighttime, our neighbors had brought a meal over to minister to us. 
And before we knew it, our church had started this meal train and we had meals every night for two weeks that were brought to us. And just this morning before I left, my wife said, we've got two more meals coming this week. It's been four weeks ago since the surgery and we're still getting meals. We're being shown the love of Christ. You see, this is not just speaking God's word and offering words of encouragement to one another. It's being doers of the word. And yes, this kind of love, it interrupts our plans. It puts our agenda on the back burner and we care for the needs of others before our own. Our service to the Lord and his church has a much deeper meaning than good words and good works. It's all about Jesus and the talents and the spiritual gifts that he's given us to serve others. You see, you're not just filling a void. You're not just saying yes to a nominating committee at church or providing a rotation of nursery duty or volunteering at the local schools or feeding the hungry on the streets or at the food bank. You're ministering with a supernatural gifting that edifies and builds up the local church. You're not filling a void or filling a spot. You're serving King Jesus and his church. You're not keeping the nursery. You're providing an opportunity for parents to be spiritually fed in order to raise their church children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You're feeding the hungry in order for them to receive spiritual food where they will never hunger and thirst again. Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me. Well, we have a lot of least of these in our church and in our community. And when we show the love of Christ to others, you're showing your love for him. So we need this mind and we need this heart of Christ. And we must be willing to welcome and show hospitality to one another. We speak the word of Jesus to encourage one another, and then we must live the word. Does that make sense? The fifth category, offer God's grace to one another. If we're going to love one another the way that Christ loves us, then we're going to have to offer his grace to them. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 2, bear with one another in love. He says in verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I love these instructions from Paul. Bear with one another in love. In other words, put up with me. (laughs) Put up with me in love. But that also means I have to put up with you in love. No matter the circumstance, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, I am to love you the way that Christ loves you, and that's unconditionally. So I have to put up, I have to bear with my spouse, my children, my boss, my coworkers, my neighbors, my friends, teachers, church members. I have to put up with them, I have to bear with them in love. I don't have to necessarily like I don't have to like the circumstance, but I have to love them and love them through it. And don't forget, we need to be speaking words of encouragement of Christ himself to them. By the way, Paul has instructed us to be kind to one another, sensitive to one another, sensitive to your needs, looking beyond the surface and looking at you through the eyes of Jesus to see you the way that he does. I want to tell you this story. I have a pastor friend. I respect him so much. I've actually preached at his church multiple times. And I walked throughout the building and there there, there were these signs, professional signs that were made that said, just be sweet. When I asked about them, he said, when he became the pastor, The church had had a troubled past, didn't have the best reputation in the community, probably known for bickering, nitpicking over the least little thing. He said, so when I arrived to the church, I just said to leadership, this pattern has to stop. It's not honoring Christ and it's ruining our witness. 
As the pastor, he said, we will love each other, respect one another, seek the unity of the church, build one another up, speak encouragement to one another. He said, I don't want any knock down, drag out business meetings, no more personal agendas. We will esteem each other higher than ourselves. In a nutshell, what I'm asking you to do as your pastor, he said, is simply be sweet. They made these trifolds for all of the church family to have. He gave me one. It's sitting on our TV stand right in front of the TV to serve as a reminder to just be sweet. You can bet your bottom dollar my wife points to it from time to time and says, just be sweet. (laughs) Do you think that's what Paul was talking about when he gave the instructions to bear with one another? Be kind to one another in love? He was saying to the church at Ephesus, might be saying to the church at Grove, just be sweet. But he also said that when someone has wronged you, to be quick to forgive just as Christ has forgiven you. This kind of love, it can hurt at times, it can sting. To swallow our pride and forgive someone completely, not keeping an account of their sins against you, not holding on to a grudge, not allowing it to cloud the way that you see them, I really think this kind of love for one another is really a Calvary love. I'm not sure that we're capable of it outside of our own forgiveness that Jesus offered to us on Calvary. And because he has, we can and we ought to forgive one another. So if we're gonna love one another the way that Jesus loves us, we need the mind and the heart of Christ We must be willing to welcome and show hospitality to one another. We should speak the word of Jesus to encourage one another. We must live the word. Fifth, we must bear with one another, be kind and forgiving to one another. And when we do this, people outside of the church, they'll take notice. Which leads us to the final category of the one another's. Love one another outside of the church. Jesus said in verse 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Hubbard says we live in a world that has its own set of one another's, one another's brokenness, one another's Hatred, one another's manipulation, one another's selfishness. And we, as the local body of believers, we exist to show the world that there is a different way. There is one way, one Lord for their life, and his name is Jesus. He reconciles us to himself. He reconciles us to each other, commanding us to love him and to love one another. So as we go out into our community, into the parks and the schools and the coffee shops and the sports leagues and into our neighborhoods. They will know whose we are because of our love for each other. Those on the outside will know that we're disciples of Jesus because of the way that we love and we treat each other on the inside. Love one another as Christ has loved you. You see, at the beginning of the message, I had you to look to your neighbor and say, I might not know you that well, but I love you. More than likely, it was lip service. Let's be real this morning. Let's be honest. Maybe we need to look to our neighbor and say, I might not know you that well, but I want to learn to love you the way that Christ loves you. Amen? Is this your desire this morning? To be obedient to what God is saying to you? The overarching command is to love one another the way that Christ loves us. Would you pray with me?
Father, I am grateful for your word, for the simplicity of this command, and yet at the same time, recognizing that it's not easy to execute, to love one another the way that you did and do. And so, Lord, I pray in this room this morning, if there's someone here who has never accepted your love for them through Jesus, today would be the day of salvation for them. And I'm grateful that we have people here who can counsel and direct them to the sacrificial love that you've displayed on us through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And for those in this room who have trusted Christ, we have the capacity to love, not because of our own doing, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to love one another. Give us the mind and heart of Jesus. Help us to open our hearts and our lives and our homes to one another. Help us to speak your word. Help us to be an encouragement to others. Help us to live the word. And through it all, help us to, to bear with one another to be kind, forgiving, just be sweet. And Lord, if we'll do that, a lost and dark and dying world will recognize whose we are. Give us divine appointments to not only let them see, but to hear the good news, the best news of Jesus. So we commit this time to you, Lord, as you speak to us, as we are obedient to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but every time the word of God is open and it's spoken, and the Holy Spirit is here in this place and speaking to our hearts and to our lives. This is a time for us to say yes or time to say no. And if we believe this is the word and he has spoken to us through the word today, this is the time to say yes. Now, I don't know what that means, how you respond to that yes. It could mean that you come to the altar and pray. I know that we have Paul here who's willing to, to pray with you and encourage you if you'd like to trust Christ or you want to rededicate your life or you just want to come and pray and just say, Lord, I haven't been loving others the way that I should. And maybe you want to go throughout this room. Maybe there's somebody you want to pull and say, pray with me. I want to encourage you. I love you. Let's just be obedient to what he's asking us to do. Can we do that? Let's stand together. As we sing, you respond.
Thank you for being in worship today. Thank you for responding to God's word, whether or not you come to the altar or whether or not it's in your pew. But let's be obedient to what he's asking us to do. Loving one another as Christ loves us. Look at here. They're loving each other, hugging each other. You might want to do that before you leave today. But thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being here this morning and being obedient to his word. I think we have some announcements. Is that right? Pastor Steve, so much for being here today. And encouraging us. We are going to ask um, Miss Kimberly Taylor to come up, um, a board member here at our church, just to give us a couple announcements and updates. So come on up, Miss Kimberly. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. So this is working. I can hear it. Um, so several announcements for um, our congregation to kind of uh, be aware of and to make sure that you are plugging in to the activity that's going on here. Um, we're pleased to announce we are going to have the Family Fall Festival. And so, yay, yay. We've had um, a great group of volunteers that have come together and just um, worked together to make sure that this happens. And so... On Saturday, October 28th, from 12.30 to 2.30, we're going to have the Fall Family Festival. So that it's going to be directed toward pre-K through 6th grade, but um, there will be bouncy houses. There are going to be activities here. We're going to have, um, obviously, the, the candy stations that we usually have. And so over the next four weeks in October, we're going to be asking that you bring candy. We're going to set up some drop stations. We'll be letting you know where those are. And if you want to volunteer, 
We're also going to have some of our leaders that are helping to work or and organize that activity out at the welcome desk. So connect with them. Let them know that you would like to help out because we'd like to have you. Okay. So also we've heard... Um, Lots of people talking about different ways of wanting to know how they can get connected in the church. So whether that would be activities that are going on, um, you know, um, classes they can get involved with, anything that's going on in the church. So if you went out to the Welcome Center this morning, you saw that there's a, um, a paper there with the financial update for the church so you can... Grab a copy of that, make yourself aware. Also at the bottom of that, there's um, ways in which you can get connected and get updates and announcements from the church. So you can scan the QR code that's in front of you on the pew there if you choose to use that route. Or you can pick up a piece of paper that's out at the Welcome Center and that can help you get connected. There's text routes, there's different ways. So, and if you need help with that, we're happy to help you. Just grab one of us, we can, we can get you connected. All right. So I talked about the monthly financial update is already out at the Welcome Desk. If you didn't see it this morning when you were coming in, it's on the end of the Welcome Desk. And I believe... Um, Bill is going to be out there helping out. Okay, he's out there already. So if you have any questions or something that we need to follow up on with you, we can certainly do that. Okay. And then uh, one other thing. So we ask that you continue to pray for leadership, for staff, for the board. Um, we're working to um, add additional members to the board. And so we've had a couple of nominations that have come forward. Rebecca Dillard and Tom Allender are going to be talking with the board this week, sharing with us more about themselves and their testimony, and next week you will get an opportunity to hear that from them too before we vote, okay? So be praying about that, um, and if there's nothing else, let me just close this in prayer and we'll go about our day. Father, thank you for the way that you provide for your church. Thank you for the volunteers that you've brought forward to help us to continue to spread your word and to minister to our people here at the church. Lord, you've always provided for us. We're, we're going to remember how you did that in the past and how you're going to continue to do that in the future. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the staff, the leadership, and our volunteers who have come forward to help us to continue this ministry. Father, thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to just be sweet to one another, Lord, to just, um, you know, connect and to make sure that we are doing everything that we do for the glory of God. In your name we pray. Amen.